it would be the lower Wissata cook. To give you a little bit of background on the pictures and so forth that you'll see, uh, one thing I discovered is that lots of times there are multiple originals. And if you place them side by side very in different collections, if you place them side by side, but there are, there are slight differences in the collections, whether it's the Patent Lumberman's Museum, Maine State Museum, or Bangor Library. Uh, and what happened was when they took pictures, oftentimes they'd take multiple pictures, uh, and then people would purchase them and they would be in various collections. But this is the lower part of the Wissata Cook. Uh, we'll go up as high as what's called the uh, Upper Crossing. To give you some background on it, at the end of the Revolutionary War, uh, the colonies were very low on money. Uh, Massachusetts was 10 cents on a dollar, the value of their money. And there was a guy named William Bingham who wanted to buy a million acres of Northern Maine. And he didn't want to buy it until there was a survey being done, had, had been done over it. So in 1793, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts hired Jonathan Maynard and Park Holland to do a survey going up the east branch of the Penobscot River. They went up part way and then they separated and Jonathan Maynard kept going up the west branch, excuse me, the east branch. And in his notes, he noted a couple, three things that were kind of interesting. He talked about Stair Falls being one of the prettiest falls he'd ever seen. But he talked about an area south of the mouth of Wissata Cook that was very fertile, flat land that was glacial in, in nature. And then he also talked a little bit higher about another stretch of land that had rows of what were wild hops growing. While they're not wild hops, if you look at um, ground, uh, ground uh, nuts, the berry and the flower look very similar. Anyway, this is a survey group um, and what they were made up of, they weren't a small thing. They went for days. Uh, they had a sur main surveyor. They had somebody to run the chain because they measured it with a chain. Um, they had people cook. They had swampers, they had people to set up their camp. It was quite an undertaking for a survey. They tried to do it in early winter before there was a lot of snow, so the swamps really didn't bother them. Uh, what his survey was to contain was six miles on either side of the river as he went up. Long story short, um, Bingham wanted to buy a million acres. It turned out to be about six million acres, so the sale never went through. The next survey that came was a few years later, and it was in 1820, same thing, Massachusetts, Maine, shy of money, divided up the northern part of the state with what was called a monument survey. And that led to the land barons buying all the land that they could. The reason they bought the land was because lumbering was a big thing. The deep water port of Bangor uh, at the time was the largest lumber port in the world. Uh, more ships went in and out of there. They serviced Australia, Italy, and most of Europe. Uh, it was the extent that they could go up river with the tall ships. So in 1840, kind of the beginning of the heyday, there were 300 mills, sawmills, along the banks of the rivers and streams that surrounded Bangor. So this was the era when they were bringing in long logs. You can see a couple rafts of logs there. They brought the long logs, floated them down the river, it slowly worked their way up the West Branch and the East Branch into the Allagash. And really what they had done is surrounded what would have been Baxter State Park and Wissata Cook River Valley. They surrounded it because the mouth of the Wissata Cook is a very deep wooded canyon, uh, difficult to get in. It's very mountainous terrain. Uh, it was extremely difficult to maneuver in, in the area. This is the view that entered eventually. This road was made in 1839. It was a county road. Um, we call it the Swift Brook Road. If you look at it today, uh, you'll see that the view that you have today is not unlike the view that you had then. The big, big one was that this was the first road that entered the area, allowed the visitors to come in and for the people exploring the wilderness to build depots. The first house, the house at the beginning of the Swift Brook Road, or at the time it was called the Stacyville Tote Road, was Madison Tracy House. This was the closest um, last bit of civilization before you entered the woods. It was close to a town called Davidson, which is no longer in existence. 
and about the same distance, perhaps a little bit more from Stacyville. So the main roads reached both of them, the rails reached both of them. In 1908, seven and six, they had the largest number of deer registered in the state of Maine, to give you an idea how important this was as a, as a depot. It was a main place that people stayed. Uh, there's still little bits of remnants there and the family is still, still in the area. This is a picture taken by Lucian Merrill. Um, he was one of the explorers, visited, visited it twice. Uh, the other thing you can see here is the wagon. A couple of things you should notice about the wagon is this is a passenger wagon. Sometimes they call it a stagecoach, but it was basically very flexible boards and light enough so that the visitors who were on there or sports that were on there going into the woods when they got stuck could pick it up and move it. The horses were treated very well, although this one looks a little bit skinny. Uh, this is a uh, F.W. Hardy took this picture. Uh, this is probably the earliest picture of the Hunt Farm been able to find. It was a stereoscope. Uh, you see it in many places. And the way you can tell it, it's the original that is because whoever had it wrote on it with pencil with a piece of paper on top and there are scars and scratches in the picture. This is part of the Lumberman's Museum collection, um, which is <clears throat> another valuable collection. The house was was built in 1883. It was an 80-acre farm that had been cleared by his workers. His workers got paid 10 cents a day. Uh, he had a sawmill there that he cut boards. So he could cut up to 300 board feet of wood a year. It was a saw sawmill where one person was on top and the other one was in a pit underneath. Um, not a particularly good way. When he moved to the area, um, he had purchased this land from his brother. And he came down the Savoyce River, and it was obvious that he'd seen the survey report of Maynard because this was a place that Maynard described as being flat and very, very fertile. Um, it made it kind of a special place. He grew crops. He could grow two crops of hay a year, a full crop of potatoes. And what made it important was two things. This was a glacial delta. It was in 12,000 years ago. It was at the edge of the ocean. So the sand built up and formed a delta that allowed for a very shallow, well-drained area. When he moved here from Carthage, which is in southwestern Maine, he left his wife, who was pregnant at the time, and, and uh, eight of their children moved in here. When he went back to get her the next year, brought her up. The first child, which was Levi Hunt, was born in 1834. And the second one was Joseph, that was born in 1836. One of the perhaps more interesting stories was that since this was a way, way building for people and they stayed overnight to keep their visitors happy, he had a few barrels of rum. And so the family lore says that one day when nobody was around, he went down and sampled an excessive amount of the rum. Uh, and the next morning he decided that never again would he sell that foul substance to anybody. And from that point on, it was a dry establishment. In 1848, he sold it to his son. Um, this is a picture of just before it was abandoned. In, <clears throat> excuse me, 1874, it was sold to a person named Chauncey Patterson. Chauncey Patterson ran a tavern at the beginning where the Swift Road, Swift Rook Road met, or the Stacyville State Road, met the Aroostook Road, um, just about where the Sherman Cemetery is. Um, and he knew very well what type of business it had, and he thought there would be the potential that he could perhaps um, make this as part, part of his route. It was finally abandoned in 1894 um, when Lucian Merrill visited. Part of the reason it, made, it was so important was because it's, it was a glacial delta, that meant that it was extremely well-drained. It allowed the horse and wagon, this is an 1894 picture, the horse and wagon to simply drive across the stream. Uh, there were three fords in the area. There was one here, one just above the Wasada Cook, and one just below what was called Lunksu's Farm. Uh, and in shallow water, or in most water, it was no more than three feet deep and they didn't have any problem 
going across it with, with horses. Being a glacial delta, um, it was formed by the flow of the river, rivers going into the ocean as the glacier melted. And so too has it been disappearing over the years from the river flowing down. In 1980, uh, the, the, excuse me, 1950, the uh, electric company opened the dam and washed away what was left of the foundation of the building. And in 1982, uh, there was another heavy flood that took away much of it. But there's approximately 100 feet of the shore uh, that's no longer there. And the river changes each year. Along the edge, all along the edges where they use for a dump, you find a tremendous amount of pottery and other, other small items. Oops. In the next individual to come was a man named Simon Gates. Simon Gates had a hotel in Wynn, the Katahdin Hotel. It was the largest one north of Bangor. Uh, it was also at the railhead for a long period of time. He purchased a second hotel in Matawamkeg, the Matawamkeg House, another huge hotel. He tried to purchase the Tracy House, but he had no luck. But he did purchase, finally, in 1881, the Hunt Farm. Uh, Simon Gates purchased not only the Hunt Farm, but he purchased all the property, too. When he purchased the property, he built what was called the Matagammon House because the Hunt Farm was in such bad shape, he tore it down. A little bit of the building is still remaining that you can see on the right-hand side there. But the rest of it, that big building was to be his, one, of his, one of his hotels. It had nine rooms uh, and could sleep a number of guests. He bought it from the buildings from Chauncey Patterson. He bought the land from Hunt. Uh, Patterson, at the same time, leased the land upstream that would become Lunksu's farm. The condition under which he rented the land or leased the land was that he couldn't have any sports. And the reason that Gates wanted that in the, in the uh, bill of sale was that he wanted to be able to have all the business. The next house we run into is the Patterson House. The Patterson House um, came and there was a person named Hiram Dacey that built a farm, was a friend of William Hunt, built a farm and cleared land and grew land where there was supposed to be hops growing wild. It's flat, it's very fertile. Uh, there are no hops there, but there are still some non-native trees that were planted long ago that have pretty much taken over. This camp became known as the Patterson Camp or the Patterson Building, and he couldn't use it for sports. Um, it was eventually leased out and became known as the East Branch House, the same building. It was moved several times in several different locations. In the old pictures, you'll see it in one location. Then the next picture, a few years later, you'll see it in another location. It was not unusual for men back in that period of time to move whole buildings. Hiram Dacey's building was falling down, so they eventually ripped it down. Um, and as I said, this was rented by Ayers and Rogers to, for their operation. In 19, excuse me, in 1892, they put a ferry in. They put a ferry in to get more business. And that ferry could take a four horse team with a loaded wagon across in a relatively deep area. It came down a road that was specially designed called the Mountain Tote Road to the edge of the river where a small stream entered and it was the only place for a long period of time up or down the river that had any depth to it. While the depth was only about four feet right off the banks, it was more than enough to float the, the ferry. The ferry operated until 1922. Logging essentially ended on the other side of the river in 1919 due to fires, floods, and, and other things that we'll get into a little bit later. But the ferry carried on for, for a little bit. Uh, the, it was a cable ferry, a cable hooked on both sides. And what it did is it went 45 degrees upstream as it went across. The reason was the ferry acted as a sail, like a sail in a sailboat, and the current would help it go across. Then it went back on its own, empty. The next building we have here in the background was the Lung Hotel. 
because Patterson couldn't have a place and, and uh, built a, the house just over the property where his original house was, was right on the property line between a guy named Charles Adams and Simon Gates. And so he went over the line, rented the land from Charles Adams and built this massive hotel in 1895. The hotel was kind of a nice, a nice place. It had multiple additions throughout the years. Uh, it had a kind of a watch on top so people in a real buggy weather could sit up there and view Katahdin. It had three floors. The first floor was a uh, living room, kitchen, so forth. Uh, the second floor was rooms. And the third floor was where the people who worked there stayed. On the right-hand side of this picture was part of the summer kitchen. On the left-hand side of the picture was part of the, the total kitchen. It was so important that they delivered mail to it from the day that it was open until it burned down in 1908. In 1908, after it burned, it was rebuilt by Rogers and uh, Charles Adams. Uh, this was a, the second rendition of Long Seuss. And you can see the Patterson house had been moved at that point to the left. It was moved again to the right, back and forth several times. But this is um, and it was taken by one of the Rogers. When they first came, they built a road. Once they got the fort across, they headed up the Wasatacook. And this is the 1841 road they built up there. It was the Reed Camp. And at that particular time, they were headed up there for what were called tall pines or long pines or pine boards to take to Bangor. In 1841 uh, through 1848, they cut it, but they never got a log out. Um, the reason, because it was so full of rocks and boulders um, that it jammed up so badly that when they arrived in 1883, this is what they saw. This is a view at a place called Orin Falls. Um, and these are long logs that are piled. And they say, according to a uh, report by Hale, who was one of the early visitors, there were some places with 50 feet high piled with logs. So what they had to do is they had to prepare the stream. In preparing the stream, um, they had to remove rocks, had to construct the edges, had to construct camps, and they had to have camps. This is a typical early camp. Um, some say it's a reed camp. I think the reed camp was a little smaller. The Reed Camp was really the first logging camp on the Wasatacook. A camp like this would have, you can see there are a number of horses there. The horses and men all lived together in the same cabin. Um, men slept under on a single bed with a single quilt, sharing whatever they could share, living on beans. Uh, and it wasn't really too many early chimneys. So consequently, the cabin would fill with smoke, but they always took these pictures. These pictures are really typical of what would be done on a Sunday. Um, just as today, when they take class pictures for seniors, there's always somebody who tries to have a little joke or something. If you look on the roof carefully, the guy in the center has his jug with him, which wasn't something that was allowed. The horses were well taken care of and lived in the back part of the camp. Uh, they had a floor in their building. Uh, whereas the men had dirt floor. The reason they had a floor was to protect their, protect their feet. Working upstream, this is the first of two dozen dams that were built. This is also one of the more interesting ones because this was taken in 1894. Uh, there was no date in it. Uh, I found a picture in four collections. And if you look in the center where the cursor is there, that's called a shakedown shelter. That was Lucian Merrill's shelter when he came to visit. So you're able to date pictures a lot of times by what you see in association with it. You also wander around to find out where this was taken and match it up with today's picture. There were multiple gates. The dam got removed every other year by flooding. Uh, it was built and enlarged three different times. The two piers that you see in the foreground there are what they used to collect logs. 
parts of the dam, parts of the crib, the dug pits, uh, and their work camp are still all visible, not too far behind. But when Ayers and Roger, excuse me, when Tracy and Love started to log in this area, they spent $4,000, they used several tons of dynamite, and there were six loggers that cleared the stream that died. Today, if you look carefully in the stream, all the way up, way up in the back, so you can see rocks that were blown in half. And if you look carefully, you can match the rocks in the stream. But what they did was they lined the stream so that log, the long logs could come down through without any issue. This is kind of an interesting one. This is what's called the lower crossing. When they moved up in 1841, they discovered the remnants of an old camp here. That was where the Reed camp was. Um, they call this one the Parker House. It was called the Parker House, uh, which was built in 1883 after the famous Parker House in Boston, uh, which was a luxury hotel. In 1912, this completely washed out. It's also the location of what was called the Lower Katahdin Crossing. As they came up from the mouth of the Wissatacook, headed towards Baxter, deep into the heart of Baxter, at the, looking for the tall timber, they ran into what was called a glacial moraine. That glacial moraine is Orin Falls. And they stopped because they couldn't get their wagons up over it. It's a high pile of rocks. They backtracked until they found the first shallow, boulder-free section of the river that they could cross in, which was here. And this is where they made the lower crossing. Some of you may have heard of Marcus Keep. He was the individual that pioneered a trail from here uh, to the top of Katahdin. Um, he was a preacher from Ashland, and he had a lifelong obsession with, with uh, Katahdin and the Wissatico. The next house that we move upstream is called the Draper Halfway House. Sometimes it's called Nine Mile Camp. There were two Draper Halfway Houses. Um, this was, they finally made it up over the moraine at Orin Falls. And you can still follow that today because the moraine has rock lined edges where the men move the rocks other side. And going through the woods, you can follow this rock lined path right to this location here. This was the location of the upper Katahdin crossing, crossing that was used by Percival Baxter, crossing that was used by Theodore Roosevelt, and crossing that was used by many others. Uh, some people feel that between this and the next one was probably where Don Fenler saw the remnants of an old building. It was halfway between Lunx's camp and New City in the heart of Baxter. It was on the edge of what was called a Wasada Cook Tote Road. And just upstream from this is another moraine um, that prevented them from going any further. As they went further, uh, they came, once they got up over the moraine, they came to an extremely large, shallow place. This particular place is called Robar Dam and Robar Camps. The wing dams are here. Uh, the problem with this was that. It was an extremely wide stretch, uh, very, very shallow. And the logs would hang here quite often when they're trying to drive them downstream. They would hang enough so that when they built the dam and all the buildings, they simply took the wood that was stuck in the river and built it. What it did is it had a head of about eight feet, raise enough water so they could float the logs through the flatlands and get it into the swift water again. The interesting one here is Isaiah Robar uh, was a hermit. He lived for a while in Patterson's camp before Patterson paid him to leave, came up here, worked as a cook for a number of years. He was a good enough cook that they allowed him to build a camp. Uh, his camp, the uh, Daisy camp, and the Hunt Farm are the only stone foundations that there are within the within the monument that we've found so far. He was good enough to let anybody stay with him. Uh, he was your classic main guide, could tell stories. He loved the leather stocking tales, James Fenmore Cooper, and uh, would embellish those tales 
place himself in there. He lived there kind of as a semi-hermit cook uh, with his dog, Kelly, for years. This next photo is across from Orin Falls. In 1884, excuse me, let's go back, 1883 was what was called the main cyclone. The main cyclone was a storm, a huge late fall storm that blew down most of the trees that you find on Dacey Mountain, that you found on Turner Mountain, you found on uh, the lower part of Traveler, uh, Hawthorne Mountains. So it really devastated the valley. The, valley. the trees were blown down in such mass that they never really reached the ground. So what happened was, as they piled up, they were air dried. And then in July 29th of the next year, some fishermen at Norway Falls, which is just inside that boundary of Baxter, trying to fight off mosquitoes, built a campfire. The campfire started and it burned downstream and it burned just about half of what the monument would be and a little bit of what would be Baxter. Um, this is 10 years after the fire. It burned 22,000 acres um, and they tried to salvage as much wood as they could before the worms got to it. The road that we're talking about, this is the road, the 1841 road that went really from the East Branch of Penobscot all the way to the top of um, many of the peaks in the central part of Baxter. It isn't a road that we'd recognize today. We probably wouldn't even recognize it as a, as a trail. But if you look on the side, you can see the big rocks. It's pretty flat. And what they would do is they would force their wagons um, up over these rocks. The wagons were flexible enough, carried supplies that the men could lift them. But the construction of the wagon made it flexible so that it was a semi-pleasant uh, road. The road was a road of convenience. A road of convenience meant uh, if the stream was flat, uh, they'd take the stream, the road would widen the stream. Uh, if there was an open place through the forest, they'd take the forest so that it would go in a variety of ways. When they constructed the roads, it was a special task to construct them. Uh, this is a classic road. You can still find these old roads. When men came to the woods, some of them had skills as cutters, some of them had skills as cooks, some of them had skills as blacksmith. The camp cook at the turn of the century, 1900, and the camp blacksmith were the two highest paid people. They were paid double what the cutters were paid. But you also had people that were unskilled in any type of labor at all, and they were paid half of what the cutters were, about a quarter of what the cook got paid. And it was their job when they cut a road, and the roads were typically 80 feet wide, to leave that 10 foot spot in the middle right down to bare ground. They did that because they didn't really want it to drain. They didn't want it to turn to mud. Uh, they banked the edges with logs or dirt so that if the horses were in a flat area, the horses could be allowed to take the lumber, or excuse me, the logs to the yard without necessarily having a driver. The horses would follow the path, and then when they got emptied, they'd turn around and come, and come back. It was as, as simple as that. The roads in the bad parts were the real tough ones. And today we still run into these roads. Um, and the roads were flattened. First snow came, they rolled them, then they dragged them, and then they iced them. So this is an ice drag. What they did is they filled it full of water at the river, stream, swamp, anywhere they could drove it along the road, it sprinkled ice. So once the wagon got moving, and the key was get it moving because if it sat there with all that weight, it would freeze in. But once it got moving, uh, the horses took very little effort to, continually, to continue to pull it. The roads, <clears throat> this is a classic road. This is another road that goes out of the top part of the monument from a Burt Call collection. This is what's called the Codroy Road. A Codroy Road was a place that was either very rocky or very muddy or simply wouldn't hold up. And so what they did is they put logs crossways in it. And you can see the grooves that have been worn here by the sleds in the winter and the wheels in the summer. On the left-hand side in the center, you can see a telephone pole. 
um, at the starting at the turn of the century, once they had radios, everything had wires. If you've ever been in the woods, it doesn't take very far to go and you can see wires everywhere. It was their way of communication. It was a way of letting uh, people know uh, where the log drive was, when the log drive was ready, and kind of keep them in contact in case it was a fire with outside world. Did you want to do something now, Kayla? Sure. Yep. I was just getting a kick out of some of the comments about the roads you're showing us, Eric. <laughs> How bumpy oh, those must have been. <laughs> And it's hard to imagine, but uh, today we can still walk on those roads. Uh, but those of you who've been in Chimney Pond, that was the road that went up into Basin. Uh, if you've been to Dacey Mountain, that was the road that went up to the fire tower, up to the fire. Uh, there was a road that went up Horse Mountain. Uh, they had roads everywhere. And where there was a road, they used the old vehicles up until the end of World War I, even through the beginning of World War II, to go to these places. Go oh, ahead. my goodness. I'm just trying to imagine that that ride. Although, like you said, it must have been nice, you know, versus what other options there could have been. But anyway, um, we're just gonna do a, a short poll right now. And you're gonna see it pop up on your screen and then I'm gonna be able to share the results with you. I'm going to launch the poll now. And while we're waiting for people to respond to that, I just wanna thank Millinocket Memorial Library for hosting us today and Eric for taking time to give this presentation. It looks like the results are coming in pretty fast. So once that poll has ended, I can share it with you and give things back to Eric to finish the second half of this presentation. It'll just be another moment here. I think we got most of them, so I'm gonna end the poll and share the results with you. And it looks like we've had about 61% that have visited the monument and 39% that have not. Um, like I said before, you can find out more information on taking a trip to the monument by visiting friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters .org. I'm sorry, friends of kww.org. Um, and there's trip reports on there and um, a lot of helpful information, access to maps, things like that. Um, you can also support friends by becoming a member. So I'm going to hand things back over to Eric and stop sharing the poll now. Thank you. This is a split cabin. Uh, one of the things I found pretty confusing, I had a whole bunch of pictures of cabins, um, logging camps, and they all look the same to me. Found out recently that they're all different and they were made under the same plan. So they had each, whether it was Ayers and Rogers or Tracy and Love or Draper, they all had a set of plans that they used to build their camps. This is a split camp where half the, the right-hand side is where the men lived. The left-hand side is where the cooking was done. If you look in the bottom area here, you can see barrels of various sizes. The food came in once a year. They didn't have much in the way of anything that was fresh. So it was always sent in in barrels. Today, in the old logging sites, one of the first things you find are old barrel hoops. This is kind of an interesting one. Uh, the men that worked in the woods worked hard. Uh, they didn't wear much, no matter how cold it was. Uh, this is a, probably a cookie in the front. He was the helper of the cook and brought the food to the men. And the bull cook was in the back. Bull cook was simply somebody that had perhaps been injured or just basically the camp go-to, camp gopher. You can see the metal cup. Uh, as I said, they had four meals a day, a breakfast, first breakfast, second breakfast, lunch, and a supper. Uh, it was all served in metal. Rules were pretty clear. They weren't allowed to talk. Uh, the reason they weren't being paid to talk, they were being paid to cut wood. Um, they left their plates upside down and cups upside down on the table. So when they came in, they sat in their seat uh, and their cup and plate that they had cleaned up before, however they cleaned it, was still waiting for them. If you were a new person that came to the camp, you waited until everybody was seated before you found an empty seat so you could, so you could sit in it. This is what's called a jump sled. A lot of times when camps were abandoned, for instance, this old, old camp here, people who didn't have jobs, perhaps a cutter or the cutter's family would come into the woods and take over one of these camps and haul all their, all their belongings, 
the hay for the horse, everything that they had, and they would live in that camp for the summer. Uh, families would take over abandoned logging camps. Um, this is the Madison Tracy family that came in. Um, they typically could supply fresh meat from deer. In the early years, uh, caribou were a target. When Tracy and Love got there in the 1800s, caribou were a prime target because caribou, when one would get shot and fall down, the others would gather around it, so it made it easy for them to shoot them all. Um, part of the reason perhaps we don't, don't have any anymore. The common construction, this is the, the classic construction that a man named Edward Draper used, and it's a double camp. The left-hand side is where the cook and his kitchen was, and the right-hand side are where the lumbermen or the loggers lived. Uh, there are a few windows in this one. The windows typically had bars. It wasn't to keep people in, it was to keep bears out. The uh, loggers were not allowed to go through the kitchen. They were not allowed to be in the kitchen. They were not allowed to talk in the, in the kitchen. <clears throat> you had a person like this um, who was called the line boss, and he went from camp to camp to camp for the operator to make sure everything was coordinated. And he had no when to when to leave or when to move a camp from one place to another to make sure they had the, the greatest supply. Two of the primary things right here, using long logs, the tool on the left is called a PV. It was invented in um, Eddington by a blacksmith in 1858. It modified several times. The boots had chocks or cocks or spikes or they were hobnailed, whatever you want to call them, but it allowed the men to walk on the, on the logs. How important were those boots? Well, to give you an example of how important they were, a lot of times when they came to town for a break, they would not wear their boots. They came over the shoulders to protect the spike. If the logger died, typically what they did, bury him, uh, put some type of insignia on something, then hang his boots from a tree. And his boots on the tree were the memory of, of who he was. Oops, I'm sorry. This is a pick pole, a pike pole, came from old time. Old times, they used to joust with them. It had a twisted end. They could throw it across, stick it in a log with a twist of the wrist, it would come out and pull the, pull the smaller pieces out. The next tool that came in was this one right here. Uh, in my opinion, one of the nastier tools that there is. It has a backwards ax handle on it in a pick, it's called a pickaroon. Um, if they missed the log, uh, typically their leg was where the thing would end up. This was a tool of choice when they switched from long logs into pulp in 1910. The pulp was destined for East Millinock and Millinock Mills, and it didn't take a lot of men to move a log as opposed to what it did before. Other tools of the trade, Right here we have a crosscut saw, very light, two types of teeth. It emulated what a chainsaw blade is today. It had cutting teeth and teeth to remove the, the bark. Uh, it was from 1880. It showed up in Maine in 1900. The one in the middle was your classic Maine ax. It was a blunt, one-sided ax. <clears throat> Excuse me, in the heyday of axes in 1890, there were 300 axe makers in the state of Maine. The axe to the right side there is a double bitted axe. That double bitted axe um, was brought to Maine by a guy named William Manny in 1900. Uh, it's what we recognize with Paul Bunyan, but what it's called is a Minnesota or Michigan axe. Uh, and as I said, it was not used here in the early years. The next tool that we find is a bateau. Bateau, probably most familiar with it, Washington crossing the Delaware. It's been around for a long time. The men would work here, they're working on some long logs. Uh, they would bring up the jam in case the jam started to let go. He hung out there so they could hop on the boat. He could get away before the men got sucked into the river. It followed the river downstream uh, with the supplies. The kitchen came in, their meals came in it. Uh, it was kind of a do all everything. Um, a guy named Horse Maynard 
in Bangor was probably the premier maker of them, and he could make 75 of them a year. Uh, they were 32 feet long and four feet deep. Typical load here, you see this is a typical load. You see really huge. What I've discovered uh, reading some of the old books, uh, they used to load the horses up with three or four times what they could carry. And typically that was simply done for a picture. But these men here are taking load out. Chains were common. Uh, PV was used to tighten the chains. You had a driver or a teamster that would work it. So chains were are, and still are, are found everywhere. Classic camp, uh, horses very, very well taken care of. Uh, you had two types of animals that worked the forest, horses uh, and oxen. Oxen worked where it was steep and rough terrain. Most of the oxen came from Machias and they were raised on marsh grass along the ocean. Um, kind of cutting time a little short here. This is a sawmill. Sawmills came in in two ways, horse run and sawmill. The other one that there was is a lot of times they bring supplies in with a tractor. Once the tractor was in there, they disassemble a the tractor, use the motor as a sawmill. So we had sawmills way, way in the woods. Lunch, this is a, a group from Lee, a uh, classic picture. Uh, it was taken <coughs> in 1890. It was a William Rideout crew from Lee, Maine. He was a crew boss. And this is lunch at Orrin Falls, a lunch break at Orrin Falls. One of the, this is the piles of logs that they piled along the edge of the river uh, for the spring flood. Uh, streams, very small streams that you can't even imagine they drive logs down, they did. What makes this special is it shows how large the log piles could be. And the job in the spring was for the men to go out and do what was called break the pile. To break the pile, they had a log at the very bottom that was set to hold all the other logs in place. And it was their job to go in and pull that log out and then get out of the way before all that logs rolling down would crush them. As I said before, the river drive early was for pine. And then in 1883, it switched to long log spruce. And then in 1910, it switched to spruce pulpwood. A lot of people think that when there's a log jam, it was a, there's a key log, but that's not so. Um, there are several logs and a person would be to go out and kind of wiggle the logs around until they could free one and the jam would let go and they'd run and get out of the way. Uh, if that didn't work, uh, they placed dynamite in it and exploded and hoped that that let it go. Blowing jams was kind of a last resort because they had to lug the dynamite in uh, and use it up and it wasn't any good. This picture is not the best in the world, but it shows, gives you an example. This is by Robar Dam. This shows what the train was like in the rocks. And this is during the pulp era, 1911. Um, and these guys are doing what's called picking the rear. When you pick the rear, that was about 80% of the work of a log drive. What they did is they had to take all the logs that were stuck. Some they left to make wing dams or keep the logs flowing in the middle. Others they would remove. Typical river crew, they always had to have the picture. They didn't necessarily all have the name. Some of them couldn't write. Uh, some weren't quite sure what their name was, but they all had, every crew has a picture and they formed the picture. And this is really the best record of a typical river drive crew. This is a PV hauler. A PV hauler was the first mechanical log hauler that they had. It was made by the same person that made the PV, the tool. It was run by three people. One person, the one in the middle, fed the, fed the fuel to it. The one in the back was the engineer. He kept the power up. And the front guy was uh, the one that would steer it. It would work well on flats. Uh, it was experimental. It hauled a little bit of wood, but not that much. And the last remaining one uh, that I know of was in Greenville in a barn uh, and disappeared in the 70s. The next one, which is the one you hear more about, is a Lombard hauler. They had a Lombard hauler that ran on steam. They had a Lombard tractor that ran on either diesel or, or gasoline. Uh, it was an internal combustion. The steam one was very, very powerful. It took four people to run it. They, it steered from up front. 
<clears throat> it had one person that kept the fire going. It kept it as hot as possible. It had an engineer to keep it running and it had a conductor because these could haul so much. It only went five miles an hour, but it could haul a million board feet of wood, uh, which made it well worth its, worth its while. It cost $5,000. Uh, in Patton, it was the Merrill Lumber Company, American Thread Road. They purchased two of them. Uh, there were 81 of them that were produced from 1901 to 1917. It was produced by Lombard in a uh, blacksmith in, in Waterville. Uh, and May 21, 1901 was the first one. What makes it most important is if you look at that track, it was the first continuous track ever. And today it's still used on tanks, bulldozers, uh, and the pat pattern still holds. This last good picture that I have here is a Lombard. A Lombard was big, went five miles an hour. Obviously, it's a pretty big piece of machinery if it's holding a million board feet of wood uh, with one guy steering. They had a difficult time turning it around. Quite typically, what most people don't realize is that they use horses to help turn it around in tight areas. So these horses are getting ready to help that Lombard turn around. Now this picture is not a picture <clears throat> on the Wissata Cook, but it's a picture that I think will show you exactly what these guys could do. This is Shinbrook Falls, Shinbrook Falls, and many of you have seen it. Uh, if you haven't, it's a waterfall because they wanted to run logs down it, what they did is rebuilt the whole thing as a sluice way. So the water would flow down it, they could keep the logs going. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty sizable uh, structure. And they would do almost anything they could to get the wood out of the woods. Back to the original picture to show you some of the things. Uh, if you look down here in the lower right-hand corner is the Tracy farm. This was the Swift Brook Road. When you hit the town line, it was a John Stacy halfway house. There, there was a road that went to Lunksus that was constructed by Rogers to cut out the Hunt Farm. Uh, the reason they did that is because they wanted the business over the Hunt Farm. We have the road from Happy Corner that came in around 1905. We have the Ford that crosses here. The Ford went across in three different places and the ferry went across another place. You have a road that goes up along the river. That was called the East Branch Tote Road. Um, this is the Wissata Cook Tote Road here that went up along the Wissata Cook Stream. Had some obscure trails that went across. Had the lower crossing, the upper crossing, nine mile camps, and just above upper crossing, just off the map, would be row bar camps. One road here that shows is the Sandbank Trail. Uh, that was one that was developed by Madison Tracy. Uh, he was in hopes to have the, uh, Stacyville was in hopes to be the entrance to Katahdin uh, Game Preserve and Katahdin State Park. Uh, and if possible, it became Katahdin National Park, but the Great Northern wasn't real happy with it. So the Great Northern um, pretty much cut it every year so that they, they couldn't have it. Uh, where am I heading from here? Uh, the next portion is the upper Wissata Cook Valley, the history, the same period of time. I had way too many to, I tried to do it together one time and just had way too many pictures. Uh, further information, I have two books. Um, one's supposed to show up in early July, the one on the, on the uh, right-hand side, excuse me, left-hand side. The other one's supposed to show up in the fall um, with COVID-19, who knows when they're going to show up. <laughs> If you like the history, hashtag KWWNM history will take you uh, to little vignettes. I started this project and I have approximately 800 pictures, old pictures and who they're from. Uh, and so in the books, I used about 200 of them. So these, this program here comes from the other 600 and the little history blurbs that I do daily because I can sit down on a rainy day and do 30 of them and uh, the pictures show up. Um, are where the other pictures, where the other pictures come from. So what we'll do now, since we're almost out of time, you have a little bit of time for questions. Thanks, Eric. 
Um, there's a few that came up in the, the chat box. Um, I think Aiden was asking about Shinbrook Falls, and it is Shinbrook, Shin um, as Diana said, and that's up past Mount Chase area. Correct, Eric? Is that the right one? <laughs> it's, off the, uh, it's just off the Route 159, about halfway between Patton and the East Branch of Penobscot. Perfect. And then Kyle's wondering if there's going to be a presentation scheduled for the Upper Wasatta Cook. Well, hope to. I'm in the process of putting it together. It's up to uh, the powers to be. So you can answer that better than I. <laughs> but yeah, that would be the game plan. We'll, we'll um, put that down in our idea box for sure and um, talk with Millinocket Memorial Library. Again, thanks to them. Donald's wondering if there were some roads that were kept longer than others. East Branch Road you can still use, for example. The East Branch Road is still part there. They call it the Old River Road. It has a bunch of different names. Some places call it the Burma Road. <clears throat> it really went from Dolby uh, as part of the uh, American Thread Road, the Southern American Thread Road, not the one that's up near Patton. And the American Thread Company was a company, a group of companies, including the Merrill Lumber Company. And they were really located in Milo. And they were up there just for yellow birch. And they were there for yellow birch because that's what they made schools out of. So they constructed the road. The <clears throat> one, the East Branch Road goes to Bolin Camps. And then from Bolin Camps, it comes out on Water Street in Patton. Um, Probably the longest lasting road there uh, would be the Wasada Cook Road that was functionally used. The Stacyville Road, which is the Swift Brook Road, uh, basically by the time Don Fenler was there, um, so when Don Fenler's father came in to visit, he said that the road was almost impassable. My dad uh, was there the week after Don Fenler, and he recalls uh, they started to ride in the road, made it about a half mile, and had to walk the rest of the way. It was so bad. Uh, so. That'll give you an idea how quickly it went downhill. The Mountain Tote Road to Stacyville uh, lasted only about 15 years. Uh, part of the reason is because the Hunt Farm did not gain the business that they thought they were going to gain. So Lunxus became the, the most important, important of the camps. Um, and I just wanted to point out too. Very short -lived. Yeah, David uh, Woodbury. If, David, if I'm saying your last name wrong, I apologize, Woodbury. He had mentioned earlier too that they used those pick poles in the grinder room at the Millinocket Mill, which I thought was really interesting. No. So I just wanted to share. When I was a kid, I can remember using the uh, pickaroons in the wood room in East Millinocket. And the thing it always, as a little kid, you don't really understand, but I couldn't understand why they all had metal shin guards. <laughs> and uh, it didn't seem to bother them. And then uh, once I got a tool in my hand, I realized why they had metal shin guards. But these guys were loggers and they didn't use metal, metal shin guards. They still use pick poles. Uh, we would recognize it as a, a canoe pole. You can see most people in the river have one. It's basically the same thing with a little bit different, little bit different tip. And it maybe one more. It sorry. was made out of black spruce or ash because of strength and flexibility. Okay, thank you. And maybe one last question. Linda's wondering if your book talks about the Tracy and Love in the Grand Falls area, Tracy and Love operation. <clears throat> one does and one doesn't. Uh, the one Katahdin Woods and Water, I stopped at what was called the uh, Town Line Brook going upstream. And the other one um, involves mostly the, just the Wasada Cook Valley. The one Katahdin Woods and Water also talks about the logging history of places like Haskell Pitch the Bolin camps, the Federal Fish Hatchery, um, Tracy camps, uh, the Cushman camps, and so forth. So, Great. Well, thank you again, Eric Hendrickson, for joining us today. This was a lot of fun, a lot of great images. Thanks to Millinocket Memorial Library for hosting this virtual event. And um, like I said, if you have any questions, you can find us uh, at friendsofkww.org, or my email was in the chat box, um, which is also on the website. Thanks again, everyone. Take care.